County. And that all translates to savings. I know maybe people don't see it immediately throughout the county, but here's a report that indicates that savings. And uh, um, I think it's uh, the savings that we are experiencing through Michael's initiatives is paying for his job and, and making us money. So um, my, I guess, accolades to, to Michael. And uh, I guess um, it was also mentioned that the Delhi Administration Building received uh, an award um, for, I think it's in the information package, but maybe, maybe I could ask Michael to explain that award to us. With how did that happen and what's the significance of that uh, award? Sure, I, I will allow that at this time. Uh, through the chair, uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so the, the Delhi Administration Building uh, was recently recognized by uh, NR Canada uh, as uh, one of the first uh, buildings in all of Canada to receive the Energy Star certification. So uh, essentially, uh, the Delhi Administration Building uh, as an office building performed better than uh, 93% of the buildings within Canada. I would say that that's a pretty prestigious award and uh, I, I'm pretty, pretty darn sure that Michael had something to do with that. So um, that was the end of my comments. I don't know if you need a mover on this. But if you I do, do need a mover and a second. I would move it. Councillor Black moves this. Councillor Brunton seconds it. Okay. It's a... Uh, <clears throat> The staff report PW 1826, the Corporation Norfolk County Annual Energy Report 2018, be received as information. Those in favor? Those opposed? That's carried. Thank you. The, the one question I had, perhaps it's, this is for Ms. Robinson, the fact that we contract out some work, more work than we used to. Does that save us in energy costs, save for vehicles and that type of thing? Is that shown in this formula? Um, through the chairman to council, uh, we contract out uh, certain work, but that doesn't affect the, the current uses that we had. We, um, the county has been growing over a considerable number of years, so there's actually more work. So in fact, we are actually reducing our footprint considerably and not and that's uh, an additional work that's being taken on but we're I don't know if I actually answered that question very well <laughs> um, we are in fact doing that these are it's all included in our calculations um, with respect to that to ensure that we are reducing our footprint okay thank you okay we'll move on to the next report it's on page 17 it's the 2017 investment results we did have a question uh, raised by a counselor on that and I'm going to uh, over here, Kathy, are you going to give this one? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this report uh, before Council tonight is also an annual report uh, regarding the 2017 investment results as required under the Municipal Act and the Ontario Regulation Governing Investments. Uh, if you look on page 17, the table um, that's presented is a snapshot at the end of December 31st, 2017. You'll notice that it's a um, higher than the previous years. As a result of that, that was um, we had some demand on our reserve funds at the time for capital projects, and, and during 2017, we issued a debenture amount of 19, just close to 19.1 million dollars. So that's why there's a little higher balance. And again, this is a snapshot at the end of December 31st. Um, staff do. Um, um, review and monitor cash balances on a daily basis. We do have some staff al allocated to investments um, regarding our daily cash balances. Um, we're looking at allocating more time, hopefully, in the future for um, staff to take the time um, to do this. There are other changes that we're looking at also in the pre presentation of the report for next year. I know Mr. Johnson would like to um, see some changes. The report is based on how we did it in the past um, and how the previous treasurer at the time um, presented the information. But I know next year um, I'm working with James to change and provide more detailed information. And I believe also he'll be looking at presenting both the legacy fund and the investments, um, the daily investment um, results at the same time for next year. 
Uh, overall, from last year, um, we did do, uh, our performance had increased. Um, and again, basically because we had um, a higher cash balance and the interest rates were slightly um, higher. And just getting back to the table, I just wanted to explain that you have the high balance also, but that's at the end of December. In January and February, we generally have a lot of pressures because we haven't had a tax um, installment date since Octo the end of October of 17. So you'll normally see in January and um, February and March, those balances of investments actually went down quite a bit. And we've just had an another installment, so we've reinvested um, monies of during this week for that. So it goes up and down on a daily basis. What's the problem? Did we cut you off, Kath? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I just, when I read this, and I just kind of baffled me in a way because, and Kathy, if I may, through you, Mr. Chairman, Am I reading this right, that we made $426,000 roughly on $18 million, the money market fund? Is that right? Through the chair to council, that's correct. And yet on our legacy fund of roughly $70 million, we made $275,000. That's hard to, to swallow. And that's not your, nothing to do with your, but I just, it baffles me when I read that. And uh, I guess what I'm... Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, when I look at this, GICs, term deposits, um, <laughs> I guess I'm starting to wonder what we're doing with uh, some investment company and uh, investing in the one fund. Do we have an agreement with the one fund? Is it is it a written out agreement on everything that we both parties do? Is there an agreement? Uh, through the chair, I believe there is, especially with the legacy fund and the, and the one fund. Um, in, I do not believe we have any um, short-term investments at this time with the one fund. No, so, but, but that, there's a written agreement. Who signed that? Would, uh, uh, I've never seen an agreement. Did it, ever, it never came before this council, did it? Um, through the chair to um, chairman to council. I'm sorry I don't have that answer for you, but um, I can uh, review it with Mr. Johnson when he returns, and we can get that information to you. I think uh, the if, agreement. It, if it's a one fund, we should deal with that under other business and make sure we stick to this one here. Okay? That's fine. That's fine. Any further? No, Height, Councillor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to Ms. LaPlante. On page 18 or two of three on your report, it talks about Norfolk County securities. I see we do purchase internal debentures here, and we averaged a 2.61% rate of return. It appears that you're using money from reserve funds to hold these debentures, and then the interest goes back into the reserve funds. Is that how that works? Through the chair um, to council, that's correct. The maturity also is 2021 for these. Uh, there was, would have been a bylaw passed by council on regarding the interest rate and the terms. Uh, and so we pay the interest, it's just to another fund basically, or into another savings account. Is that not correct? That's correct. And what's the limit that we can handle there? Just whatever's cash is in our reserve accounts? That's correct. Hmm. Okay. That's correct. Oh, it is. So, like, do you have any um, other ones that you're looking to do in 2018? Um, through the chair to um, council. At this time, we're, we are not looking at any um, internal debt. Um, again, I know that is on Mr. Johnson's um, plate to have a look and to uh, review the current um, internal debt issues and any future ones. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Are there any other questions? Oh, I need a mover and a seconder. Mayor Lucan moves. Councillor Oliver seconds. Any uh, further comments or discussion? That report, FS1814, read 2017 investment results be received as information. Those in favor? Those opposed? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move to page 21. I just want to report that Judy Ann McCulley has joined us and she's going to be uh, videoing our performance of our meeting. So, councillors, uh, behave. <laughs> Okay, this report is being delivered by, uh, who we got here? Sarah Townsend. Oh, sorry. Go for it. 
Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair to Council. I'm here tonight to present um, a report on the conversion of emergency vehicles. So there's two things that are going to come up in this report. I just wanted to explain a little further. Conversion versus certification. Um, all our vehicles used to come through the ministry before it was downloaded, clearly. Um, when that downloaded happened in 2001, Roland Emergency Vehicles was the only vendor that was providing both inspection, conversion, and certification of emergency vehicles. So this is taking a normal pickup truck and making it a response vehicle, or a van chassis and adding a box on the back and making it an ambulance. It includes, um, the conversion itself includes things like electrical systems for the lighting, sirens, things like that. Upgraded mechanical systems, oxygen delivery systems, suction units, um, venting and air movement systems, and basically overall loading on the vehicle, um, pull testing, rollover testing, MBC testing, everything like that. So that's all in within the conversion. The certification of the vehicle then includes things like um, applicable statutes in the Canadian Electrical Code, the Canadian Standards Association Group, uh, the Ministry of Transport Annual Inspection, and then everything that they do clearly has to go through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to be compliant with the Ambulance Act and our provincial equipment standards. With all of that being said, over the last um, few years, we have continued our relationship with the Rollins. We've found, found them consistently a high quality work. They provide a great turnaround on the um, work that we are providing, and the warranty is above standard of everything that we've seen. Um, there are two other companies in Ontario that are currently, have recently joined the market. The feedback that we have been given from our colleagues across the province is that there has been significant delays in receiving their vehicles, and in addition, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of the vehicles that have been delivered um, from these conversion companies have failed certification on a ministry level. In order to continue the service that we provide and ensure that we are maintaining all our certifications and regulations with the Ministry of Health, thus our service provider um, certification as well, we are requesting a three-year term to just do the conversion of these vehicles at Rollins. So we would still be tendering um, at least quotes, but most likely tendering given the pricing for the actual vehicle chassis itself. This is just where we would send it to then be converted to an emergency vehicle. With that, I'd add, I'm available for any questions. Questions of Ms. Town? Doug? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just through you to Sarah. Sarah, what, can you tell me how much you've spent with this company in the last, uh, or since, uh, I think I had the date written down here, 2003 Three or six? is it? I'm sorry, I lost it here. Since we've been with them anyways, how much, can you give me an idea what, what it's cost, Norfolk County? Through you, Mr. Chair, it is a difficult question because the vehicle conversion they do is only a part of what we get from Rollins, if that makes sense. So they're also our striker provider and they provide a great number of other equipment pieces and things like that. Conversion itself on the vehicle, depending on the chassis that you're chosen, so it's obviously different for the things like the minivan we have ordered in the past, or the administration car versus doing a full emergency support unit or emergency response vehicle. They run anywhere from 11,000 to 24,000, depending on the chassis itself. Um, the conversion of the ambulances is actually contracted through our ambulance provider. So we aren't subcontracting them. That is all one kind of pocket deal that our provider is dealing with Rollins but all of our emergency response vehicles, so the ones the supervisors are driving to do first response, things like that. So the, um, right now we have two expeditions and a suburban that are, and a minivan for the community paramedic, things like that. So those vehicles is what we're speaking to. And so over the past, I would say five, six years when we just replaced all of those vehicles, they're running in between 11,000 and 16,000. So when you buy, uh, when we've, in the budget we have a new ambulance you're saying you buy that complete from a supplier and that's already been converted correct correct 
Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. So there, the two main ambulance companies are coming from Saskatchewan and Quebec City. So that is why they actually have to go through an Ontario certification process when they come to this province. So they have already contracted Rollins through that process, but that is a one-shot deal for us. We order them directly from the provider and they do the certification at Rollins before we get them. So when we buy a new ambulance, I want to get this clear in my own mind, we get competitive bids at uh, the, in the initial purchase. It's when you send it back for repairs or something, you want to use Rollins. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes and no. The ambulances themselves, yeah. um, we will be going to RFP because that has never been done in the past. So okay. we will have a provider. The conversion, everything is included in that. Correct. What we're saying right now is, so for example, this year we're replacing the emergency support unit which is a suburban right now. So what we will do is tender out the actual vehicle and then we're asking for permission to send it to Rollins to convert it into an emergency response vehicle. And you're, and you're saying there are two other suppliers to, that would do that work, but they, I guess the workmanship or you're, you're not in favor of, uh, based on the comments you made, of using those other two companies, correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct, and that is why we have actually recommended just a three-year term. We'd like to see after that three-year term in 2020 if we will can find other providers that will provide the level of service that we've come to expect. Would these other companies uh, be scrutinized? Like, if they haven't met the standards, uh, would they be, uh, like, scrutinized or penalized by the province in some way so they, they do get on board to supply these vehicles in a proper manner? Through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct. So we are um, required to submit to Ministry of Health inspections at any given point, but every three years, and ours is next year, um, we go through a certification process in order to maintain our ambulance certificate to provide an ambulance service. So when those inspectors come in, any vehicle that fails certification has to go back. And so it's been more of a count of when they found these vehicles that haven't met certain aspects of certification, they have to send them back and that's causing further delays. But when the inspectors find that on your service review, that is marks they take off your final service review process that you have to enact before they'll give you your certificate to provide ambulance service. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? Mayor Luke? Well, the recommendations there on page 21, I'd like to move it and get it on the floor, please. Okay. Seconder? Councillor Oliver. That. Okay, I will read it, the recommendation that staff report CS 1815 conversion of emergency vehicles be received as information and that council permits a single source standardization as outlined in Norfolk County Purchasing Policy ECS-02 section 4.8.4 for the mandatory certified emergency conversion of all paramedic services vehicles. And further that council approves Roland Emergency and Specialty Vehicles Incorporated as the single source supplier of the mandatory certified emergency conversion of all paramedic service vehicles. And further that this sort, single source standardization for emergency conversion commence July 1st, 2018 and continue until June 30th, 2021, at which time paramedic services will conduct an industry-wide assessment for availability of certified sources for future conversion needs. Mayor Luke. Well, Mr. Chair, just quickly and strongly supporting this, we have to standardize our vehicles uh, in, the, um, in the emergency vehicles, and, and we know that. Um, this company that we are already with, look at their record over the last 35 years. They have never had an issue with noncompliance. That's the type of people I want to continue to work with so that uh, we keep things as best we can keep them. And that's the way it's been, and this is going to keep it that way, in my opinion. Thank you. Anything further? I'll call the vote. Those in favor? Those opposed? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, page 25. And this is with respect to the junior hockey ice rates. Mr. Cridlin's going to take the lead on that.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, staff, staff report CS 1826 junior hockey rate, ice rate report, or, um, is from a deputation of a representative of the, um, um, the Delhi Travelers that were here a few months ago. And what the, rep, or the um, deputation was asking for was that the junior hockey rates um, for not only his club, but also the Simcoe and Dover Club be reduced to the minor hockey rates. So what staff have put together here is, is a report on that issue. We have contacted a few um, local or, or neighboring municipalities, compared not only their um, uh, junior hockey rates, but their minor, non-prime, and prime uh, ice rentals. And what staff are recommending is, is at the current time we stay with the uh, current uh, junior hockey rate. Um, we're working with finance staff. As council will know, last year we worked on the marina's um, user fees and we were quite successful in bringing them up, leveling them out where they needed, lowering in other places to, to be more competitive with the private markets. And um, we would like to, we, we have that plan for 218 as well to, to go through the ICE rental rates. So we are, we are recommending that no changes be made until we go through the user fees in 218, which will be established for 219. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it, or turn it over to County Council for any questions you may have. Questions for Mr. Crisland? Do not see any questions. Is there, Councilor Black? To move the recommendation in the report. Okay, second to Councilor Wells. And I'll read the recommendation that report CS 1826 junior hockey ice rates be received and that council approves to maintain the current rates for the junior hockey ice rental fee outlined in the 2018 user fee bylaw 2017-127 with no changes at this time. Anything further? Those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. And now Page 29, the multi-use recreational facilities 2018 funding. And this is going to be delivered by... Okay, Mr. Cripps. Uh, this is the uh, first time we come to you asking you to pay the piper. <laughs> it, uh, it likely won't be the last. Uh, we do, however, intend it to be the last on this, this issue, this term of council. Uh, we have been working diligently on a number of fronts. Um, obviously, the key meeting, uh, at least from my perspective, being the, uh, what we anticipate being more or less a full day of closed session around uh, potential locations. Uh, the work we've done thus far has not been without cost and we're finding ourselves uh, constrained in not having a budgeted cost center to be able to continue the activities necessary to go forward with the initial um, steps required to take a serious hard look at the potential creation of a 40, 50 or $60 million building. Uh, the good news, and uh, our deputy treasurer is here to take specific questions with regard to the sources of the money and um, the accounting for same, but uh, the Coles Notes version is uh, there is $200,000 available to us that at this point is uh, not levy funding and wouldn't have a, an immediate an impact this year were you to award it to us uh, to the tax levy. Uh, that's the, the short version. Uh, we're asking for 200000 uh, because we believe that is uh, entirely adequate to get us to the end of the year um, uh, for a bunch of obvious reasons. I don't really want to discuss what, will, what I anticipate happening on the 21st other than to say you're going to start with a large choice of potential locations and presumably that will get winnowed down. I think that's a good general statement. Um, at that point, we'll be in a much better position to understand uh, what are the very specific needs will be vis-a-vis -vis, uh, external consultants, uh, none of whom will be free or cheap. I'll just remind council to recall that uh, more than a year ago, we thought it would take roughly $50,000 uh, when we knew very, very little, and that the lowest bid from a competitive process was $98,000 to come up with some initial work. 
And then, of course, Council did a fair amount of that initial work itself by uh, going through the community and engaging with it. But uh, we know from that experience, at least, that uh, one might reasonably conclude that there's a, around six figures needed for some consulting work. Um, rather than go on, I think uh, the Deputy Treasurer and I would like to welcome questions. Uh, $12,000 of that, uh, the 200000 ask, would be for specific training for some lower to mid-level staff members who are likely to be involved in this project for some number of years. There's a really great training opportunity in Brantford starting in September that uh, would greatly complement this project and I think really help people uh, grow and become um, much, much better and, and more able to offer support and service to this corporation, this community. Uh, so we identified that specifically as one, one thing we would use some of the money for. Um, and with that being said, I'd be very happy to take your questions. Madam Deputy Treasurer, do you have any comments at this time? Uh, nothing additional at this time, no, thank you. Okay, we'll go to the floor. Mayor Luke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to Mr. Cribbs. Um, I want to just be clear on the funding for this. And uh, I, I've had uh, feedback, as I'm sure many of you have, on people supporting. And I actually have had uh, an inquiry today concerned about this 200000 and not realizing where the source of funding is coming from. Certainly, I think everybody around this table is well aware where the $50,000 is uh, income or interest money previously from the good days of legacy investing in 2016. Um, the other 150, and I assume that the um, Evergreen Hill Road project that was deferred is the sidewalk road reconstruction, but where specifically did we get uh, this Invest in Ontario uh, reserve fund. Is it cash that's sitting there now? Is it part of a, is that the total amount in that reserve? Is it part of a larger amount? I'm just not, it's not ringing a bell where we got that dough from and when. Uh, through the chair to Mayor Luke, that 150000 is all that's remaining of those funds. And it was uh, granted to the county some time ago to be used for infrastructure funding. Okay, thank you. So it's funding from the province some time ago for uh, infrastructure funding and certainly when I mentioned to the inquiry I had today and it was an excellent phone call from a, from a resident to here in Ward 5 uh, he was somewhat satisfied that this was not money that would be taken out of the 2018 tax levy is that correct through the chair I mean obviously it is but I just I think the public likes to know some information on where we're going here or if we're going where it's uh, where the money's coming from through the chair to Mayor Luke, that's correct. Those funds have not been levied from the taxpayers of Norfolk County. And my last question to our uh, county CAO is, this is perhaps, we could refer to this as seed startup money that would be available. And I don't want to just say to staff, but to county that we'll be encountering costs if we are going to be serious about this project or looking at this project to see if it's, something's possible and um, so it's, it's, it's a seed money to have uh, ahead of time so that can be used as things need to be accomplished or done? Absolutely. Uh, to be abundantly clear, uh, obviously at the end of the day if some sort of significant facility is going to be built it requires funding from the other two orders of government but the initial costs uh, self-evidently need to be borne by the municipality. No um, this money, we will account for it, obviously, uh, but uh, beyond that, this, would, this will constitute part of the county's contribution towards the ultimate cost, assuming that a decision in the affirmative is ultimately made. Um, so we have to start we have to put some of our money where our mouth is and show the province. We will show that we've spent money on analysis of sites, on engineering, on architecture, on drawings, 
permits, on site analysis, on zoning amendments. On, I mean, I, go, I could keep going, but you get the idea. And the initial ball to get this rolling, the seed money, if you prefer, uh, this is that, that pot. Uh, right now, we, we simply don't have one. And, you know, for minor projects, when we get together around the senior leadership table, if we need $500 for something, we can sort of figure out, well, typically we start looking at public works. Um, but, you know, you can find those, you can't find $200,000 uh, under the mattress or in the cushions of the couch. Uh, and so we need to come to you here for this uh, at this time. Thank you. Councillor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to the CAO, I see you're looking to uh, send some staff in for some training at a cost of $4,000 per participant. Uh, what departments would these come out of? Assuming we get the funding, they will be from three different divisions. Um, we, we, we didn't specify because, of course, it, it's an ask at this point in time. We have more than three people identified, and uh, we have a number of uh, excellent potential candidates. Uh, that being said, I, for a number of reasons, I can't exactly specifically identify them to you at, at this point in time. Th this project is involving staff from every division in this corporation. Uh, I, I can tell you that everyone's been obligated to put staff forward and uh, there's no one that's not represented at that table. Yeah, thank you for that. Like, I guess my concern is that they have day-to-day -day jobs and they're probably very busy with them. So this takes them out from doing their real jobs and I assume that at some point we're going to bring in consultants that have project management specializations already and they've built buildings so just working with them would give them the experience and for twelve thousand dollars plus that doesn't include downtime while they're out of the office for days at a time for this course and I'd be concerned with that it's our belief that this program offers spectacularly good value it's eight days one day a month starting in September uh, so one day a month absence from work, although we'd notice, is not undue. It's spread out. Uh, it's taught by particularly knowledgeable faculty, ultimately out of uh, uh, Mohawk College. Uh, it's a number of municipalities getting together for this program. So it's, uh, it would be ourselves, City of Brantford, um, I believe Oxford County, most of our sort of, if you're in reasonable driving distance of Brantford. Um, this is really considered a, a, like a top-notch program. The, if you step back and say, we stop talking about a rec facility and just say building something worth 40, 50, or 60 million dollars, there is a lot of learning to be had. And ultimately, you know, the sun will continue to rise and the sun will continue to set, but we have a phenomenally good opportunity to train and develop and grow our skills as a civil service. Uh, Norfolk County's never built anything of this magnitude before, and we want to maximize our opportunity to grow our skills and knowledge. We have a number of uh, junior to mid-level uh, staff who we think would be excellent participants in this and could really uh, be with the, con uh, the corporation for a long time and really get a lot out of this. So to have the academic uh, and the theoretical simultaneous to actually the doing I think would be a tremendously strong, uh, like a uniquely strong opportunity for professional growth. Okay, thank you for that. But like we have training conferences, <clears throat> seminar budget that's somewhere around half a million per year. And this is on top of that. I, I feel we spend quite a bit already on training. You couldn't find efficiencies or enough money in that budget to cover this. It all gets billed specifically for this one item, yet it's used across the corporation. These skills will be when they're done. Uh, I don't want to disagree with council, but I will point out to this council that two years ago it cut $100,000 from the training budget, and last year all it did was restore 1.7%, i.e. inflation. So I would not describe our training budgets as generous. I would just categorically disagree with that. But moving past that statement, what training dollars we do have are designed for 
the daily jobs that the staff of the corporation of Norfolk County provide. And most of those training dollars are for, I mean, I, I look at my own. I attend things offered by the Law Society of, Upper Canada, or of Ontario now uh, so that I can maintain my license. That's true of our nurses, that's true of our engineers, that's true, and so it goes. Uh, this is a unique project that doesn't fit in the daily um, job description of anyone, really. Uh, we're all sort of uh, operating somewhat, somewhat outside our normal parameters on this one. And so uh, given that we have non-levy dollars available and an opportunity to send three people, not, not 30, not 10, we think three would be reasonable. Uh, this is a, a good time to access monies that came from elsewhere to help develop our staff uh, skill, knowledge, and capacity. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm certainly going to support the recommendation in the report on this project. I, I'm really pleased to see uh, this request coming forward that staff are prepared to start doing some of the, I guess, more in-depth analysis of this to try and see if it is in fact feasible and, uh, and to put some meat around the bones, I guess, of the idea that we know our community is very firmly behind. Um, Mr. Cribbs, in one of his comments, touched on where I was going to go with my question, Mr. Chair, and that is accounting for the money. It, it would be my request or suggestion uh, through council to staff that we make a special, uh, not effort, because I know staff will do it, but that we set in place whatever uh, mechanisms are required in order to be able to account in detail for this funding and how it's spent over the next uh, perhaps 8 to 12 months. I think that would be part of the accountability that the public will want and I think we will be able to show uh, provided there is tracking of the expenditure of these dollars. So I'm not suggesting it needs to be part of the motion, Mr. Chair, but if somehow Mr. Cribbs can note and the, and the minutes can reflect that uh, if that's what council feels, if council agrees with my suggestion, that we uh, ensure that there's accurate tracking and periodic reporting to council on the expenditure of these funds. Comment from staff. Um, through the chair to Councillor Oliver, we will be setting up a separate cost center for this and all the costs as well as the funding will be tracked separately so that we can have those details available. Okay, Councillor Black. I'd like to move the recommendation in the report, if there's a second to speak to it. Okay, I thought someone already had moved it, didn't no? Okay, so you're moving it? Seconder? Councillor Oliver seconds that motion. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, um, I think we we all knew that this was coming. You can't move forward with a project like this without any any funding that's going towards it. And I, th I thank staff for being innovative and coming up with uh, a way to provide these funds without costing the taxpayers any money. We have uh, 150,000 provincial dollars that was, was not uh, spent and allocated to this. And the, the $50,000 was already um, allocated by this council. Uh, from interest that we made in the legacy fund. Um, so from that perspective, uh, that's um, a, a good way to start as far as I'm concerned. Um, the hiring of individuals and having an expertise, and I, I buy everything that uh, uh, our CAO said. It makes sense to me that people need to be educated. It's something that we've never we haven't done a project this large before, and I think it's, it's smart to be able to be on top of it in terms of uh, being educated uh, in, in terms of the things that we, we don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I would have only assumed that the um, that staff would have set up a, a totally different and separate cost center to uh, allocate the the uh, revenue and the expenses for for this, and they've they said they will, and uh, I'm sure that will lead to um, uh, very visible accountability in in terms of uh, where the money's coming from and where it's going to. So, um, 
And just to also mention that uh, I'm sure all of us have received emails from people again showing support for moving forward with this. And it is, I guess you could say, our second step. And there will be many other steps in this process, and I try to explain that to people, that we're not going from point A to point Z all in one big leap. We're, we're taking this project because it is complicated very seriously, one step at a time. And we, we don't know if we're going to end up with a multi-use recreational facility. I can't guarantee that to anybody. All I can guarantee is that there are steps that I support investigating and to get to that uh, investigative stage uh, with good information, we need to allocate this money. Okay. The motion is on the floor. Uh, any further comments? Councillor Oliver? Mr. Chair, could I request a recorded vote on this, please? Not at committee? Not at committee, no. Okay, thank you. Anything further? I, I just want to make a comment that I, I'm glad that this report does not use the word hub. It uses multi-use recreational facilities, and we did receive dozens of emails today about this report, and they all call it a hub, hub, hub. And you know the hub of a wheel gets all the grease, and outside there, anybody outside that perhaps would feel like a fifth wheel. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that the, the word hub is not used. Okay, I'm going to call the, uh, the yes, Councilor Black. If it makes you feel any better, I agree with you. And I, you, I didn't make any reference to the word hub when, when I was speaking. I said multi-use recreational facility. I guess you could call it a MRF. Um, I don't know if that's any better than a hub, but it does make more sense to me to make reference to uh, multi-use recreational facility, and I use that term with everybody I speak to. Good. Okay, call the vote. Those in favor? Those opposed? One opposed. That's carried. Thank you. The, uh, the food is here. We have uh, over an hour left before we go to our presentation by uh, our uh, inspector of uh, OPP, Norfolk OPP. Do you want to keep going or did you want to stop at this time? We can get a couple more reports in perhaps. Do you want to go to a couple more reports? Okay, we'll, we'll do that. We'll go to report number, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Climate Change Planning, and this is Staff Report PW 1836 on page 51. This year's, uh, Mr. Simone. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the Chair to Council, before you is the uh, Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Climate Change Planning Report. Uh, if you recall, Council approved joining the Federation of Canadian Municipalities in February of this year. Uh, this opened up access to FCM grant funding. <clears throat> the FCM has recently announced grant staff, grant, staff grants for greenhouse gas emissions and climate adaptation plans. <clears throat> staff ad have identified three options for proceeding with the staff grant as outlined in the report. Staff recommend proceeding with option two outlined in the report. In this option, an application would be made to FCM for uh, an existing FTE staff resource to oversee the plan development and implementation. The money received from the grant would then be used to hire a consultant for their expertise in the plan creation. <clears throat> By having a plan, it opens up grant opportunities for the county. The FCM Grant Green Municipal Fund, along with the Ontario Municipal Greenhouse Gas Emissions Fund, Challenge Fund. And with that, I'll answer any questions of Council. Questions to Mr. Simones? Councillor Wells? If I understand this correctly, the uh, cost to the county would be $7,000, is that correct? 
Through the chair to Councillor Wells, that is correct. The net cost would be $7,000 um, for the plan creation, uh, which could be further offset by 15000 if we were successful in our Ontario Municipal uh, Greenhouse Gas Challenge Fund application. So potentially a net savings of $8,000. <clears> Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm certainly going to support this recommendation, but I, I did send a couple of questions to staff asking clarification. I think I cc'd it to members of council. Michael, I'm just a little bit unclear, I guess, still. In the recommendation, it refers to uh, greenhouse gas emission climate change adaptation plan, sort of an either or, and yet, obviously, I think it would be our hope and intent that we would perhaps do both, and I would like to suggest, given what we have in our energy conservation and demand management plan already, the emphasis needs to be on climate change adaptation. So are you fairly confident that, that we will have flexibility, assuming we get funding and we, we put in our application, et cetera, et cetera, that we will have flexibility to put, should council choose and staff choose, put more emphasis on the climate change adaptation aspect of this initiative, which I would suggest there is a huge need for uh, in the future. And, and this county would be well served, I think, if we undertook such a thing. That's my question, though. Will we, will we be obligated, if you like, to spend half of our time and half of our resources on uh, carbon reductions versus climate change adaptation, or will it be somewhat flexible uh, th through the chair um, we certainly are our, our, our intent is to do both uh, as you alluded to um, certainly there will be no obligation to concentrate on on either or so our our application will be to to do both the climate ad adaptation plan as as well as the greenhouse gas emission reduction plan um, if I could, just one follow-up, Mr. Chairman, and I wish I'd had, I wish I'd brought it with me this afternoon, I forgot, but uh, at the uh, Municipal West Conference last fall, I had the opportunity to sit in on a session that was led by the region of Durham, Regional Municipality of Durham on the east side of Toronto, and they had just completed and were presenting on a climate change adaptation plan and strategy that that municipality had done. And... Uh, I was really, really impressed by it in terms of the initiatives. I think Mayor Luke has seen the report, and I know Ms. Robinson, and I think Michael has seen the report. And I, assuming this resolution passes today, I will make a point next week of bringing that in, and I would encourage all of council, we can take turns just passing it around to get a sense of what kind of things are, are looked at and should be proactively planned for in terms of municipal adaptation to climate change, which is inevitably happening, of course. So I, I really think this is a good initiative, and uh, I'm certainly going to support it. Okay. Next, any further questions? Councilor Black. It's ready to move the motion. Okay, Councilor Black moves the motion. Seconder. Mayor Luke. I saw a hand up, Councilor Height. Uh, I have some questions, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> what the difference between option two and option three? So option two, we hire a consultant. Option three is we let our, our staff work away at this for two years. And I see a, the consultant costs $85,000. But I don't see a cost on option three, other than it says that some capital projects could be delayed while this report is being done. So could someone clarify a bit the differences between those two? Uh, three, uh, the chair through uh, to Councillor Height. Um, so option two is using an existing um, staff resource on a 0.5 FT basis, approximately, um, for the duration of the project uh, with the hiring of a consultant. Option three is uh, dedicating that FTE full time to the development of the project. Uh, in terms of, of cost, there would, there would still, we would require some consultant costs, um, more for um, data from third parties 
So there, there are some consultant costs that would be required for option three as well. Through the chairman to council, um, although perhaps we didn't articulate it as clearly as, as we could have, um, if our existing staff member who is fully engaged is now being 100% dedicated to this project for a year or two, we're unable to have the ability to undertake those duties that that staff person would normally have undertaken. In this particular group, um, the excellent energy report that we just saw earlier this evening, that's something that that staff member is currently working on. Those types of things would be, we would have to either have somebody else do that by going out and you'd see us here in the future saying, we now need a, a consultant to come in to basically backfill our, our staff member's full-time position in order to do that. Um, this particular position is also filled doing things like um, our roofing contracts and all that sort of stuff without having that staff member available to do that and being effectively seconded to this project we're going to be coming back to council as we come across things that can't be delayed it's not possible at this point to quantify that um, which is why staff have recommended option two because it's a really good hybrid it allows us um, to work our capital plan for 2019 and 2020 recognizing that we're going to have a, um, somewhat of a limited resource, but we still have the funding that we're hopeful that we're going to get in order to um, allow the other projects to move forward. So two sort of a hybrid that works the best case scenario. It allows the important projects in our capital budget to continue to go forward, as well as allow us to apply for funding and move forward with this initiative as well. Okay, thank you for that. Now, just to be clear, option two is still going to take the two years? Through the chairperson to council, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Councilor Black. Speaking in favor of uh, my motion, I, I know that there's uh, some people, some individuals south of the border that have their heads buried in the sand, <laughs> deny that climate change or climate is not being affected by people, but I don't feel that way. I think it's uh, the, the responsible thing for government to. Uh, recognize that people do have an effect on our climate and that we need to accommodate that and this is what we're doing we're, we're going to uh, it's a challenge uh, we know that the climate does af affect or people do affect the climate and we need to plan for that so I think it's the environmentally responsible thing for all governments to be involved in anything further questions or comments I do have a mover. Councilor Black moves. Mayor Luke seconds that is following recommendation that PW 1836, Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Climate Change Planning, be received as information. And that Council approve option two as recommended by staff to apply for the Climate Change Staff Grant through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to hire a consultant. And further, that if the Climate Change Staff Grant is successful, that the approved 2018 levy supported operating budget be amended for the creation of a greenhouse gas emissions climate adaptation plan with funding to be provided from the climate change staff grant and the levy. And further that staff be directed to apply for funding through the Ontario Municipal Greenhouse Gas Challenge Fund for the building insulation envelope upgrades and further that if the Ontario Municipal Greenhouse Gas Challenge Fund application is successful. The approved 2018 levy supported operating budget be amended to reduce the general building re reserve contribution by $15,000 and include funding of $15,000. Nothing further. Those in favor of the recommendation. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. And now we'll move on to page 55. This is with respect to the uh, Financial Services Department. And uh, I guess that's yours, Sue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this report and the next one both deal with tax policy. They're both reports that Council sees on an annual basis. Uh, so I won't bore you, and I'll try to keep a, uh, a brief summary of this report. Uh, report FS 1811 is regarding 2018 tax capping and clawback parameters. In 1998, the province of Ontario introduced tax reform to base all property assessment on current value assessment, or we refer to it as CVA. 
to fully implement CVA in the commercial, industrial, and multi-residential tax classes all at once would have created significant tax shifts. So to gradually bring these property classes to full CVA, the province introduced some tax tools to limit tax increases and decreases each year. These mitigation tools are known as capping and clawback, and municipalities are required to set annual parameters prior to the final tax billing. These calculations are very complex, but in the simplest of terms, increases in taxes are capped to a certain limit and are funded by the properties within the same tax class that see a tax decrease. The province continues to introduce new measures to assist municipalities to exit capping and clawback as quickly as possible. Norfolk County has taken advantage of every opportunity the province has offered so far. Last year, the county was eligible to begin a phase-out in the commercial tax class, and in 2018, the same options are available for multi-residential and industrial tax classes. The province provides municipalities with online resources for capping and clawback calculations. Preliminary modelling for 2018 indicates that 2017 may have been the last year that there will be any properties with capping adjustments in Norfolk County. If this is the case, no properties will be adjusted in 2018 and the county will be able to formally exit the program in 2019. In the meantime, staff is recommending that the parameters outlined in this report be approved. A bylaw containing the parameters will be presented to council next week for approval. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions? Councilor Black? Well, I know everybody's looking for fairness in terms of taxation and it's a difficult thing to get. Um, and I don't know if Kathy, or if, um, if you can answer this question or not, but when I'm looking at page uh, 66, and I just did a few of my own calculations, you look at the residential uh, Norfolk County levy of 60, roughly $7 million, represents about 79% of the total. The educational levy represents about 55%, and then you go, and I just picked commercial. Um, the commercial actually represents 8% of the total, but on the education side, they're paying 26%. Like, the, the commercial part, and I know the provincial government back in the Harris days tried to move the commercial rates with this range of fairness. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Wrong report. Final tax rates. We're talking about... Uh, Final tax rates? That's what I'm talking about. Well, we're on page what? 55, Councillor Black. Oh, okay. Gee whiz. Wonder. <laughs> God, I got a long ways along there without being caught. A little bit early, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. Is there any other uh, question? Mayor Luke. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I just wanted to, to show you I'm not perfect, that's all. Back to page 55. Well, actually, we might as well finish up Councillor Black's report. No, get we're down going the to page 55. Back to <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, um, three, um, I guess my, my question is, this report, 1811, which uh, we're trying to clear up and finish up, a 20-year, what we've been doing since 1998, good idea. Uh, so I guess, and in, in through you to Sue, and asking this, with these seven um, possible transition tools you have here on page 57, I guess the bottom line is the residential, the, the, the single-family dwelling type of thing, this has nothing to do with them. This is industrial, this is multi-residential, and um, I think it's commercial. Is that, is that a fair statement? Through the chair to Mayor Luke, that's correct. So oh. residential was taxed at CVA right away, right. and it was phased in through capping and clawback for the commercial, industrial, multi-res. So I just, you know, and, and certainly you, you've written a good report, and I, I think I'm getting my head around here what the ultimate outcome will be, but um, going back to those three tax uh, categories, if I can call them, what is the worst, if 
I owned an industry or I had a commercial enterprise or multi-residential -res tax bill, uh, what's the worst case scenario that would happen to me in 2018 based on what this council is asking to sort of finish up here on this project? Through the, chair, through the chair to Mayor Luke, if I understand correctly, um, the worst case scenario would be that a property would be taxed at its full value and in 2018. In 